I've, I've never got out of a car and thought, if I stay out here, I'll die. You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello and welcome to The Cosmic Cast. Your hosts today, it's me, the Incredible Hulk, Marissa Lowe. To my right, Iron Man himself, Tom Harvey. That's clever. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Iron Man, yeah. Uh, across the table from me, is that Catwoman? <laughs> <laughs> John Pernay Fisher. <laughs> and our special guest today, it's Wonder Woman herself, oh, Sam Bell. Very kind. <laughs> How are you doing, Sam? Not too bad, thank you. How are so, you? So, you're a fourth year PhD student here at Manchester. Yeah. Um, and you look at the moon, I believe. I do look at the moon. Yeah. Very um, tiny bits of the moon. Tiny bits of the moon. So, what are they? Um, so, I look at thin sections. And uh, so, they're like really tiny, really thin slivers of rock that's been like ground down. So that uh, we can let light pass through it and uh, we see which different minerals there are th- in, the, in the samples. And in particular, I look at Apollo 15 samples. Oh, okay. So uh, what rock types are they in particular? Um, basalts. So like erupted out of volcanoes like you would do at Iceland and Hawaii and different places. Uh, and what's the main aim of your PhD? What are you hoping to find out from these Mare basalts? Um, we're trying to understand more about like their magmatic history. So like what happened to these magmas, like what happened to the crystals in them on their way up to the surface? Did they mix with magmas? Did they get crystals added into the magmas? Did crystals get taken away? And trying to work out you know, how this magmatic history had some effect on what we see in the samples that we collected at the surface. Um, yeah. Um, so you're working your way through uh, publishing this, in fact, at the moment, aren't you? I am, yeah. We've uh, we've just done some work using ChemScan, which is like a system that can give us maps of our sample that tell us which minerals are which. And um, we're trying to use that to um, automatically separate crystals out from each other because part of my project's been looking at crystal size distributions. So... Um, I've manually been having to draw around a lot of crystal boundaries to work out the different size populations within my samples. Um, but we're hoping that ChemScan or the idea of ChemScan was to uh, see if it could do that mm. manually for us. But uh, And the idea of doing, doing these crystal size distributions, this is what tells you how fast lavas cool, is that right? Yeah, you can you can work out different uh, things to do with like residence time, so how long mm-hmm. uh, crystals have been residing in a magma and... Um, the different shapes of the different graphs that you produce can tell you whether you've got bigger crystals than an expected normal distribution of crystals or smaller crystals, so whether um, different processes have ha- has happened to that particular mm. set of crystals that you wouldn't normally be able to see by just scanning across a thin section. Because mm. otherwise, if you're doing these things by hand, they can, t- can take quite a long time to trace through all the crystals. I mean, how big are these thin sections? Um, so the thin sections, you know, on average size, like... I think maybe like five centimetres is the biggest mm. one, but like there's one that had way over 6,000 crystals in, so that took weeks to trace around I mean, every that sounds single quite crystal. tedious. Yeah. It was, uh, got to put Netflix on in the background and just, <laughs> yes. get, just keep clicking. So how, how do you do it? Do you print them out or do you do it on, on the computer? Yeah, it's all done on the computer, yeah. Um, just uh, drawing around uh, images of the sample, mm. yeah, just in a... Yeah, I guess it's it's something that's routinely done for terrestrial basalt, isn't it? But I guess there are not that many studies out there looking at um, extraterrestrial volcanic rocks. Yeah, there's been there's been some work done um, on like Apollo twelve samples, trying to work out whether it's Im- impact melt or mm-hmm. like um, or not. Because um, the crystal shapes and distributions would be different between an impact melt. Yeah, and a... yeah, to, uh, compared to just a, an indigenous basalt. I mm-hmm. think that's the right word. Yeah. Uh, so why in particular were you looking at Apollo 15 samples? Um, so within Apollo 15 samples, there's um, two suites. Um, essentially, they're just been, they can be separated based on the um, bulk mineralogy, so the compositions, the average compositions of the rocks um, differ between these two groups. You've got one that's got like higher silica, um, lower iron and titanium, and then the other group's got lower silica, higher iron and titanium. And uh, it's, it's trying to work out how we can get this difference that we see when the rocks have like similar eruption ages so it's it's whether these rocks have come from a similar source and something's happened to them during their magmatic history that means that they've got different compositions now um or some people argue that they they were from different sources but the most recent theory um is that they're, they're they're the same source and 
one of the groups had a more complex history that led to differences in its chemistry that we we see in the rocks on the surface now but hopefully these methods will like try and help okay so it's part of your research trying to answer that question as well yeah so I've been able to to use these techniques as John said that have been used on like terrestrial samples um to try and add to the story and you know really understand it and quantify like yes you know this this group experienced a different history and this is what we can say about that history and and this group didn't and it it instead had this history what's it been like handling the samples presumably you've got to be very careful with them (laughs) yeah i I mean i I think i've got a lot more better now than i was at the beginning but yeah at Mm -hmm. the beginning i was like shaking picking them up (laughs) so were you dealing with whole samples you said they're in thin section form now but did you when you got the delivery of moon rocks, were they as large rocks or? No, they've, they've all, I've only ever seen them as, as thin sections. So they were already pre-made um, and like we requested mm. particular thin sections. Um, Most of them are pretty old thin sections. They're all from like the 70s when they were first brought back and first sectioned. Yeah. Mm. Okay. You wonder um, how many times someone's looked at some of these. Yeah, loads. There are all the records of whose access particular samples are all out there for people to look at and things. <laughs> And I guess a lot of it's online with the virtual microscope as well. Um, yeah, to an extent. I think they've only put one or two examples per sample, haven't they, of, of thin sections? Yeah, some some of the ones that I use it, are, are on Yeah, there, it depends what of, kind of sample yeah. it is as well. Because obviously there's there's the whole kind of online lunar sample compendium, compendium yeah. yeah, which has low, kind of collated data for like every single, every single yeah. sample. But even that but is But not all of them may even have thin sections either. I mean, that was so. last updated in about 2012, 2011, I think. Mm-hmm. So there's a whole few years that are not accounted for. Yeah. Mm. So I guess for some of the larger samples, there, there may be like dozens of thin sections made. Yeah. Mm. Um, so as John was saying before, you're working on your first paper and getting that published. Mm-hmm. Um, how has that been? Um, it's been interesting. We've had uh, <laughs> some, uh, yeah, it, it went really well. And then uh, we, we sort of found an issue with our data. So, okay. uh, so where to... did you submit the paper to? Uh, general Petrology. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think it was submitted in March and then got reviews back and then been trying to work out what went wrong. And then, yeah, hopefully get them sent back soon. Okay. Were the reviews relatively nice they were really nice i always hear bad things about reviewer two whoever that is i've never (laughs) submitted a paper before so i've never had to encounter one but i mean uh, i had four and they were all very nice oh okay nice yeah four is quite a lot though isn't it i think um yeah two to three is more standard and the the issue that popped out was was not like a highlighted one it just so happened that like one of the very minor suggestions then sprung this like massive Mm. surprise like oh Mm. all you did is wrong um <laughs> but fixable that's good i guess would it be fair to say it's been a bit of a learning curve trying to figure out the quirks of how the chem scan system operates definitely yeah it's um the, it, it's really powerful in that it can do a lot of things but it's knowing how to mm-hmm. use all them things properly i mm-hmm. think and, and get everything um fine-tuned for what you want it yeah. want it to do has been has been tricky mm-hmm. but so sam what is the chem scan um, so we use it, it's uh, sort of attached to the SEM, so scanning electron microscope, and um, it uses a combination of uh, backscatter electrons, brightness. So um, when we take images of our samples, we'll sometimes like call them BSE maps, and uh, electrons get fired um, at your sample, and the way that things get backscattered then gives you like a grayscale image of your sample that you can infer things from. So some of you if i was looking at like an olivine crystal um it's got iron and magnesium in it it might have darker bits have got more magnesium lighter bits have got more iron but then to go one step further and and, and try and get some more detailed chemical analysis you can also use um eds which is energy dispersive spectrometry mm-hmm. um to try and say you know which elements you've got in that particular spot that you've uh, that you've analyzed so the chem, going back to ChemScan, it uses both of those um, in, in combination to give you a map of your sample. And then it uses a database to say, oh, well, you know, the, you've hit this spot. This has got X, Y, Z elements in it. I think it's this mineral. So whereas you would normally just get an image that um, you would then have to interpret 
either this grayscale color is this mineral or I've got this signature, you can actually, it can actually tell you, it'll give you a map and say, oh, you've got olivine here, you've got peroxine here, you've got whichever mineral it thinks it is. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so is that because different minerals will interact with those with that electron beam in different ways? Yeah. Okay. It sounds like it's kind of like a wonderful catch-all technique, doesn't it? But actually you've had to do a lot of work to develop the kind of mineral library that it compares those analyses with. Yeah, so it, it does it on like a first match basis, um, which is really tricky because you've got some minerals that are like, they have that many different elements in them that they'll ca essentially catch everything in it. So mm. amphibole has been a, a, a struggle at the beginning because that, that's got a lot of different elements or it can have a lot of different elements in it. One of them, uh, one of its components being water, which isn't really uh, a big a big part of lunar samples so mm. um, yeah that that one at the beginning a lot of the peroxine was was coming up as amphibole which was a big red flag and it's lots of little bits like that that's that's had to be sorted out to get ready and processing the way it should be I suppose it doesn't help that like like with a lot of kind of technical softwares it's not necessarily always the most intuitive no <laughs> yeah because it's a it's a third party bit of kit that you plug into the SEM isn't it yeah and yeah. hasn't the company gone bust that make it or something i have no idea i, d I, d I don't think it's uh, I, I, yeah i'm not sure it's been developed much at, yeah. at the minute cuz i guess all these things are mostly designed for industry aren't they when they're doing fairly sort of simple tasks not more complex geological activities yeah a lot of it was uh, uh, designed originally for the mining industry right, yeah. so it's mm. uh, yeah it's very much geared towards putting in samples that you sort of mm. you know what you're expecting mm. and you're trying to you know trying to spot the nice shiny bits that can make you money mm. rather than looking at crystals from the moon <laughs> but overall though has has it saved you time in terms of trying to characterize these crystal size distributions um it it's been interesting it's but the actual process of how it separates up the crystals has been it's it's been a bit tricky because it seems to be splitting up some larger crystals into mm. smaller crystals which okay. is an issue for the for the um crystal size distribution so in in practice, yes, it is a lot quicker because you know you put the sample in on a Friday afternoon, mm. you pick it up on the Monday, and notwithstanding the fact that you've had to you know tweak everything to make it work right, mm. um, you can come in on the Monday, process it all, and, and get a nice crystal size distribution relatively quickly compared to spending two weeks drawing around crystals. But mm. the intricacies of it, intricacies of it, as yeah, it's maybe not a like wonder system that will fix everything. So, going back a bit, how did you end up studying minerals on the moon? Uh, what were you doing before your PhD? Um, so, I did my undergrad at Leeds and did an uh, integrated master's in geological sciences with a year abroad. Um, so, I did my third year at uh, University of Alberta. Oh, okay. So, was that you just did your normal course as you would have done in Leeds, but it was taught out in... Canada or yeah so you, d you did um you did your third year full third year out there doing whatever you, courses you wanted to do mm. um that was equivalent to what you would have done in a third year at Leeds mm. and then uh yeah came back for for the final year yeah finished it all off how was it living there for a year it was so exciting I loved yeah. Canada yeah yeah it was great did you get to see any spectacular natural things while you were out there um went to the Rockies a couple of times um, also went up to Yellowknife, um, which is like mm. in Northwest Territories. That's cool. Uh, saw the Northern Lights. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. I feel like that's one of those things that everyone has that kind of like, wow, <laughs> reaction to, regardless of, you know, what it is that you do. Yeah. It was really cold though. It was like minus 39. So. Oh, that, wow. that is particularly cold. Yeah. Was it, um, so how was the temperature sort of year round? Um, when I first got there, it was about... 27 degrees um so it was quite warm and then uh it quickly dropped off and started snowing and yeah it was <laughs> i think before i came home for christmas it was like minus 27 when i got on the plane wow um but it was a really dry dry cold so it it, it didn't feel like i had very similar things on when i got off the plane and, and it was here and it was like one degree and i was like mm. oh i'm a bit chilly <laughs> 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 So that's not the only international expedition that you've done as part of your kind of geology career, is it? It's not. No, you've been right. to Houston. I did. For the 
Lunar and Planetary Institute summer internship, is yeah, that correct? Yeah, the uh, Exploration Science Summer Intern Programme. So it was there uh, last summer, mm-hmm. yeah, 2018. We uh, went out um, end of May and for 10 weeks we was working as part of a group on a project at the LPI. Ooh. What was it like, kind of shifting to... Houston, really Houston is a very different <laughs> climate to, to Manchester. Similarly wet maybe, but much much hotter yeah i've never felt so hot and sweaty and horrible yeah but <laughs> but yeah. that primed you perfectly to do the work presumably <laughs> <laughs> perfect fantastic air condition. conditioning yeah that was it i wanted to be inside working because exactly. it's too hot to be outside so what did they have you doing um so we was there was 10 of us all together and uh we were sort of split into into two groups and our group was looking at planning a traverse in the Schrodinger Basin on the mm-hmm. far side of the moon in the South Pole region. Um, and, uh, yeah, we was, we was trying to figure out, you know, areas of, of interest that could be done um, in a 14-day mission time frame. Ooh. So presumably, is that trying to maximise, like, how many science questions can we try and address? Yes. Yeah, so one... previous, um, previous internships have, have, have sort of focused on, like, you know, what if... If we was trying to answer these science goals, where would be the best place to answer this goal? And then that built up over years to, okay, so we've got all these different places, but is there one place that could let us answer mm-hmm. multiple goals in, in one go? Um, so Schrodinger sort of came out as, as a, a really good place to answer quite a lot of like um, outstanding lunar questions. Um, and then our project was part of... Uh, looking at the um the peak ring in this basin mm-hmm. um so material that when the basin formed has been uplifted and uh so you get to sample um different material from from depth from within depth in the in the lunar crust mm-hmm. so we were trying to pinpoint different areas that would be really good to uh to go and sample try and see if we could get any outcrop which might be a controversial way of calling them on the moon but uh <laughs> yeah seeing if uh we could we could use sort of um l rock data so from from orbit images of the surface to try and and, and target these these certain areas and plan a little route around and uh, mm-hmm. yeah it was really good it was good fun so what what does that kind of entail on a day-to-day basis are you looking at geological maps of the moon and and this like it's 3D L- LROC data, is that right? DEMs um, of the surface? We we tried making a couple of DEMs, um, but a lot of it was done, um, was looking at them online on the on the database and, mm-hmm. and downloading um, the individual like NACs, so narrow angle camera images, um, scrolling through them, trying to see if we could we could spot any features. So we, we mapped a lot of different features that then we didn't end up, mm-hmm. you know, getting picked in our final in our final routes. Um, we also used um, Moon Trek, which is like a website that you c- anybody can go on and have a, a wander around on the on the mm-hmm. lunar surface, and you can. Uh, it's got a tool where you can like um, you can you can go down to essentially like rover level. So also part of our project was to try and make a video of what it would look like if you were mm-hmm. trundling around in the Schrödinger Basin to get a, a, a different perspective on it. Because I think. Some people can see the moon and and not necessarily appreciate what it might be like to actually be stood there looking at you know mm, yeah. really tall like they're they're massive hills and it's a good and point you like, don't think about how high some of the the, yeah. the mountains yeah. let's be honest yeah like yeah. kilometers high and uh, you don't yeah you can't really get a sense of that just looking mm. like map view yeah so so to someone who hasn't really got much of a remote sensing background what kind of features can you actually see I mean like are they like lava flows or beds what what are you looking for so i struggled with this as well because i'd gone from like a thin section where you can see everything mm. to being like it's just all gray <laughs> like, <it> was, <laughs> like oh there's a boulder i don't know what else to say about that um <laughs> yeah th- so like boulders uh, a joke about them, but th- they were the, one of the things for us like was, was was spotting big ones um also looking in features like um there was a big grab and so like a fault system mm-hmm. that was running for hours um it was trying to look down that and see if we could see any sort of what we would think was exposed bedrock um mm. so trying to look for indications that that might be somewhere that you could sample in situ as opposed to sampling a boulder where you don't know where it's from mm-hmm. we could target those areas as being like we know that that is part of the peak ring in this area 
because we can see that it's sort of it, it's not just a random piece that's tumbled down a hill mm-hmm. and at that resolution have you got some chemical data as well you can use yeah so we were um we were using m cubed data mm. um and that sort of uh, it was from some previous work that had been done we, we were sort of using that to um indicate which type of lithology mm-hmm. is probably present so how does that yeah. work so uh well yeah so m cube is one of these missions that have collected a lot of um uh, infrared i think it is is it i'm not sure i can't remember it's all spectral data that they've, they've orbited and collected all this data at quite a fine resolution and so you can piece together the different um elements that the, the spectra are telling you and then you could estimate what sort of mineral assemblages are there and you can right. get some rough idea of what pathologies yeah so there. it's m cubed because it's mmm yes moon the moon mineralogy mapper that's exactly yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, I think it's, it's, I'm not, I think I'm right in saying, is it one of the most detailed mineralogical maps that we have of the moon is through that data set? It's certainly, it's certainly, a, a, it's, it's quite recent and it's it's quite high resolution. So it's enough so mm. you can see you know, the difference between like a lump of the north site versus a lump of basalt and maybe even some, but I mean, the fine scale chemical differences you'd normally look at through like normal geochemical analyses mm. perhaps isn't quite there. But for instance, you'd be able to tell if a boulder, I guess, is, a lump of a north site or, yeah, or whatever yeah and we was we was trying to look at um so like whether it could tell um sort of between a, a troctolite mm. and another an, mm. an off site yeah. um so whether it, it could be from if it had certain minerals in it that might suggest that it's from deeper within mm. when within the moon's crust as opposed to more mm. close to the surface mm. It sounds like you kind of had a, a bunch of different types of data sets coming into that. Then, did you all do kind of a little bit of everything, or did you divvy it up so that people had kind of specialties? Yeah, we we in the end we nearly um, all ended up sort of having a go at everything. Cause for our groups, people naturally certainly had different experiences, and, and mm. it was really interesting. Working you've with got everybody. engineers, haven't you, in, in some of these teams sometimes? Yeah, yeah. So that it was. Um, yeah, it was a really wide range and group of people. So that there was there were certain tasks that it was fairly obvious that somebody was a, a lot better at and a lot more mm-hmm. well suited to do. Mm-hmm. But I think certainly there was there was an effort from all of us to sort of get the most out of mm-hmm. that experience and, and get stuck in with with things that we we'd never really done before. So you're only there for ten weeks. It must be quite an intense workload then, or yeah, it was uh, at, at the beginning. You're like, oh, okay, yeah. Like this, this is really fun. Oh, okay, I can do this. Um, and then like you slowly get into it, and you're like, oh god, like there's there's a lot of work to do here. Like <laughs> we've only got ten weeks. Um, and it's sort of a mad dash to mm. get it already at the end because you you do a big report at the end. Um, so you, you write up everything that that you've you've done during mm-hmm. the ten weeks, which you forget that you actually need to do that mm-hmm. in ten weeks. Mm. Um, and then uh, yeah, you have a big big presentation. Um, which um. Yeah, you know, there's there's people get invited to to come see that at the mm. LPI, and then it gets um, done on like a, a broadcasting thing on online as well, so that people can call in and mm-hmm. uh, and yeah, ask us questions and grill us about what we've been doing for them ten weeks. Sounds mm. great. Does, so, is this like a very theoretical exercise, or or is the aim that it actually be used, you know, in a kind of theorized upcoming mission? Um. So I I think if it, it it certainly got sent to people that if they you know they wanted to use it in the future that they could um, and I think it it sort of highlights reasons why you would maybe want to go to the Schrödinger Basin mm. um, if it was to be selected in the future um, certain areas that you might want to consider and and it's it, I think it could be used in mission planning but I might be biased <laughs> <laughs> might be a load of rubbish only just <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah the the idea of the internship is for it to be very like usable like it, it it's meant to have an outcome that can be used by mm. the scientific community whether that be for for mission plannings or other things mm. so after your 10-week internship i believe you went on a road trip we around did. america yeah um, where did you go um we uh we flew to vegas um and spent a few days there we went out to uh yosemite um then uh across San Francisco, like did uh, down the coast in California. It's a good amount of driving. It, it was really fun. I really enjoyed the driving. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think I think we did try and cram a lot into two weeks, but it was definitely worth it. Like, like you hit a lot of the geological hotspots. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> pardon the pun there. Yeah. Yeah, we went to see Meteor Crater, oh. uh, Death Valley, all, all around there. Yeah, it was uh, 
Lots How was the rocks. weather? Me, uh, well, Death Valley was like, yeah. I've, I've never got out of a car and thought, if I stay out here, I'll die. <laughs> <laughs> and yet... I mean, yeah, I guess that's why they call it Death yeah, Valley. Yeah, yeah, I was like, that's a fair point, yeah. yeah. I can, you know, pat I can on the see back. where the name comes yeah. from. Yeah. It was yeah. like opening, like, you know, when you open an oven and you, like, get a bit too close and yeah. steam hits you. It's, it was like that, but just outside. Yeah. Yeah. So I, were you pleased to be back in... Yeah. The, just, by the time you got back? Just to have some normal weather. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Some nice was, rain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that was good. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess if anyone's interested in applying for the internship, um, if any students are listening, uh, the deadline to apply is in a... 17th of January. 17th of I January. Believe. So we, I, I think in general, it's a, supposed to be a really good experience. Yeah, and I, a, yeah I, I couldn't recommend it more. Like, mm-hmm. it, it was an amazing 10 weeks. It was, like, genuinely... I don't, yeah, I would have never have got mm-hmm. to do the things... Cause it's open to, to all yeah. PhD students, I think, isn't it? Yeah, so there's um, th- there's two different uh, internships. There's one for um, undergrads. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, is that? I didn't realise. Yeah, okay. yeah, they do. It's slightly different. They're sort of given in individual projects um, with, with somebody to supervise them. And then, um, yeah, so the, the the one that I did was for postgrads, but mm. that can be master's level as well. Mm, okay. um, yeah, I uh, would highly recommend people uh, applying if they were interested in it. so sam the final question we'd like to ask you is something we ask all of our guests um if you could be doing something else other than your exciting phd work um, and all of this exciting travel um it can be something in academia or outside of academia what would you want to be doing um i have to think i'm big into true crime at the minute so oh. I think like inside academia, like using Ooh. science to catch like some forensic stuff. Yeah, catch criminals with science. Mm. You could be a, f- be a forensic cool. geologist. Yeah. That's the thing, yeah. now, isn't it? Geologist. Yeah, analyzing. You know, mud, yeah, mud get some soil out of some and like shoes and see where they went. Cool. Do you think mm. you'd like to be a police officer or a detective? Nah, I'm a big wimp. So they'd be like, <laughs> "Can you go in that crime scene?" I'm like, "No, nope. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not." <laughs> it's dark. <laughs> Okay, you can hide in the lab and do the forensics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be yeah. that would be quite cool. That'd be very interesting. You get yeah. to see some pretty diverse things, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and then you'd be called up to the doctor as a witness to present your findings. Yeah, I can waffle about how the geology caught them out. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a Netflix series waiting to happen oh, there, isn't there? That would be the dream. <laughs> Foiled again by the Kimmeridge clay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, other clays are available. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose so. Yeah. I like to think that you've been waiting years to say that, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> well, ever since I was personally foiled by the Kimmeridge clay, I've just wanted to share it around, yeah, not literal. Um, Warn people. No. But excellent. Yeah. It's, uh, well, thank you very much, Sam. Thank you. Uh, it was a real me. pleasure to have you on and uh, talk to us about your project and all your travels. Good luck with the rest of your revisions. Thank and, you. And uh, once it's published, maybe you could come back on and. Uh, talk a bit more about it maybe yeah that would be good but in the meantime thank you once again and to all our listeners we'll see you next week